So good afternoon, uh, Chairman, uh, organizers. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to uh, join you uh, today at this meeting representing the ESC, the Association for Acute Cardiovascular Care, uh, in this extremely uh, hot session. So I think the two previous speakers actually really uh, led very well into uh, my talk uh, here where we combine ECMO and Impella after just having seen my possible conflicts here, you can see that uh, what already was mentioned uh, or alluded to, that we have a really a lack of evidence in, mar in, in, in cardiogenic shock. Uh, to the left, you see uh, a small study with Impella uh, versus intraortic balloon pump, no difference. On the right, a larger uh, study published in circulation with a propensity matched uh, group where also Professor Seimer uh, was part of who's going to present next. That you can see here, Impella compared to the uh, interaortic balloon pump in uh, the IABP Shock 2 trial, no difference between the two uh, devices. So, on to the presentation here uh, I, a simple angiogram. You've seen a left main stenosis presented sometimes at this meeting. Here is the osteal uh, uh, left main enlarged. Uh, in a patient presenting in, in pre-shock. And uh, the colleagues who, who did this case, Dr. Schraga, uh, felt that it was, um, let's see if we can have the movie uh, move here, was not possible to do the case without a support system. So an Impella CP was implanted, also a temporary pacemaker. And uh, then the case was uh, done, but uh, here you see after the stent implantation, I'm not going to go into the uh, details. So that was all fine and dandy, but the patient really deteriorated uh, on the table and went into respiratory failure. The anesthesiologist could not ventilate the patient anymore. So in this case, we uh, upgraded and implanted also an ECMO, having an ECMELA situation where you have the Impella as the first device and then the ECMO as the uh, second device. The rationale, of course, is to do uh, perform the left main uh, PCI. Uh, you do the PCI in the STEMI case to restore the perfusion, and you use the Impella to gain you time and possibly to vent the left ventricle in this scenario. The second problem then arises, the patient go into uh, uh, respiratory failure, Pulmonary edema cannot be ventilated on the table anymore, deteriorating cardiogenic shock with increasing lactate. So you put in the VA ECMO to secure acutely the organ perfusion and to make sure that you have uh, enough oxygen uh, in the body. And eventually, having in this case the impella in place, you could actually ask you use the impella to vent uh, or to uh, wean the patient away from the ECMO down the line in a few days as soon as possible. So, but what are the data? Well, if you see, this is also a, a publication from our group. If you see patients in cardiogenic shock to the left, you see, you see the wedge pressure of, is of course high. If you put in an ECMO only as your first device, you can see that the wedge pressure actually increases. You increase afterload significantly but you see in this uh, model that if you put in the impella, you actually, within a few uh, minutes, have an important venting and relief of the wedge pressure in uh, patients published in heart failure, uh, Jack, uh, a couple of years ago. So it actually might work. Uh, this is a study that was published two years ago in circulation, also from our group, looking at a matched comparison of VA ECMO uh, patient matched to patients uh, undergoing ECMELA. And you can see here that the probability of survival, so this is actual data, promising data, was actually improved, you know, by a p-value that is uh, just significant up to 30 days. What that means in the long run, we don't know yet, of course. So when should you consider unloading in patients who have an ECMO uh, to do this? Well. Also, data suggests from the same studies that you should do it early on. If you look here, uh, the hazards ratio uh, of mortality, you can see here that you should actually 
as the previous speaker mentioned, do it early. If you do it uh, before the VA ECMO, if you start to unload, you might actually uh, have better outcomes compared to if you try to vent the patient uh, later on as a bailout situation when you cannot ventilate the patient anymore. But there, sometimes you just have to do it. If you get a white lung syndrome, sometimes the anesthesiologists, even though they play with the machine, cannot ventilate the patients anymore, and they desaturate. Uh, if you have white lungs, that might be a good uh, indication to actually unload the uh, ventricle. We know you should look really carefully at the hemodynamic and what happens. So this is uh, the so-called watershed phenomenon. Of course, you have a retrograde perfusion if you have ECMO only. So this is an angiogram that we did looking at the uh, watershed perfusion. And you can see here that the anterograde cannula only perfuses sort of the, the arcus uh, of the aorta and not really making it all the way to the heart and to the brain arteries uh, in, in this case. This is what's called the watershed phenomenon. The two flows meet and you have actually a, uh, a competing flow in, in the system. We know this is a feared complication where you have stasis. You see that you have actually have a lot of spontaneous contrast in the left ventricle here that is not moving at all. You see the aortic valves are not opening and that might actually be a case where you have to put in an impella. This is just another uh, explanation of the so-called watershed phenomenon, which can occur of different levels, in different levels, in the aorta. And you can see here in the middle, you have the so-called Harlequin phenomenon, uh, where you have a, a uh, you know, unsaturated blow, uh, blood coming to the upper part of the body uh, because you still have outflow from the heart and you have the competing flow from the ECMO from the uh, lower extremities, which of course is uh, dangerous for the brain and heart perfusion. This is uh, a couple of pictures that show how you can have thrombus formation in the aortic outflow tract in these conditions where you have very low flow uh, in two different uh, uh, pictures here. Whether you should unload, we don't know yet. But this is one study that was just published uh, earlier uh, this year. One of the first initiatives, the early on low randomized uh, clinical trial published in circulation. You can see here that the incidence of death after 30 days was no different between the two groups, the unloading and the not unloading, so the conventional ECMO arm. But I think there are some caveats here. The unloading was done via left atrial cannulation Unloading could be done up to 12 hours after the initial procedure, although the median was pretty early, 1.1, and they had 50% crossover rate in this trial. And of course, the crossover can kill these trials as a concept. So I think it's very important that you, strict, uh, that you stick to the randomizations. So a couple of comments here. Not all shocks are equal. So we have to understand when to use which devices uh, under which circumstances this is sub the survival according to the sky class that you just saw here. If you're at risk, you have an excellent survival. If you're an extremist, you probably have an 80% uh, mortality in the first uh, 30 days. And you can see here that there's also a very large difference in the timing, whether you're admitted with cardiogenic shock or whether you develop the shock in the first hours in hospital has a lot of impact uh, on the uh, prognosis, as you see to the right. Data is coming up uh, at ACC in a few months. You will see the danger shock, the Danish-German uh, shock trial comparing Impella to conventional therapy uh, be presented probably at the ACC uh, in Atlanta. They are sort of in the CD area. In a few seconds, you will have uh, Professor Simon present to you the results of the ECLS shock and uh, we are actually now doing a randomized large trial, multi-center trial, the unload ECMO, to look at a comparison of early unloading in patients in cardiogenic shock who get an ECMO to see whether an impella on top of ECMO actually improves outcome in a patient uh, trial with uh, almost 400 patients included. So my take-home messages 
are, not all shocks are the same. Uh, you have to consider the individual patients. You have to make sure that you can manage in your shock team also all the complications that you can expect from implantations of ECMO and Impella. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you.